Hey everyone, how's it going? I know a lot of you might have seen my videos on life in Aurignacian Europe about 35,000 years ago in the interview with uh, Dr. Cosimo Post. If not, check them out. I'm really uh, pleased with how they came out. So, do that. Um, but in the Aurignacian video, I interviewed Dr. James Dilly, uh, a prehistoric tools expert, about why Aurignacian people were so enthusiastic about making uh, points from reindeer antler and I had to cut the interview down by quite a bit just for the narrative sake of the video but I thought some of you might be interested in hearing what Dr. Dilly has to say about it so uh, definitely check out ancientcraft.co.uk where you can buy Dr. Dilly's awesome reproductions and yeah just sit back relax and enjoy what he has to say see ya just as I'm about to release this video, everyone, Dr. James Dilly here, an absolute expert on prehistoric tools, maker of a brilliant YouTube series called Nap Time, the founder of ancientcraft.co.uk, where you can find beasts like this, like this Mesolithic axe he made for me at the most reasonable rate in town. Dr. Uh, Dilly here, had finished some uh, research on these Aurig Nation split base points and he's willing to uh, hop on and share his, his knowledge with us. So thank you very much for that, Dr. Dilly. That's quite all right. I feel like this is going to be the uh, Viva exam no two. Uh, contextualize the Aurig Nation for us. Tell us about your research. <laughs> yeah. So be, be uh, kind. Be kind. Oh, no, this is it's super easy. I only have one question really in that um, it just strikes me as someone who isn't uh, familiar with prehistoric tools that making something from antler would not be that sharp and it would be quite a difficult weapon to use and not as good as a stone tool perhaps is well that's exactly why the uh, PhD thesis came to be what why would you use a piece of antler when during the Mysterium beforehand, Neanderthals were using uh, Lavalois stone points, and after the Auric Nation in the Gravettian, they were using stone points again. They do use osseous points again, made of bone and antler here and there, but in the Auric Nation, they, they like their antler points. Um, and it was a case of, well, why? Why would, you, uh, why would you use antler over stone? As you said, stone is sharp, stone is pointy, stone is plentiful, and it's very quick to work, whereas antler is takes a bit of effort to work it, it's quite a time investment really in comparison i imagine it is hard to get it sharp as, yeah. because it doesn't you know flake like something like this and create a nice sharp edge on its own i imagine it has to be polished for a long yeah. time into that shape yeah i mean you've got to what, what we know that they're doing is that they're collecting antlers um from uh, reindeer um in northwest Europe, as you start to go into southwestern Europe, they're mainly relying on red deer, and, and that is purely down to availability. And just as you go further north at that time, it's a lot colder, and you tend to get a lot more reindeer. Um, to set the scene, I guess, of the Aurignacian, um, my PhD mainly focused on northwest Europe, but looked at a much broader landscape as well because there isn't a great deal of Aurignacian archaeology from the northwest so you know had to look at a broader picture of things but it would have been really cold um, we think of central France today uh, certainly uh, uh, Europeans think of central France so uh, well I'll narrow that down a bit more Brits think of central <laughs> France for a holiday destination think oh yeah nice warm wine you know perfect um go there in the summer but actually it's warm there during the autumn and winter as well perfect um during the origination um the average july temperature would have been five degrees celsius so that, you know, cold in july yeah so january Surely. december that would have been really cold so it pretty much would have been either a boreal or arctic tundra, lots of grassland, very, very few trees. Um, and that is the key, really, few trees. If, I'm sure you've seen lots of reconstructions of Ice Age settlements or some of the bone huts um, from Ukraine and, and other famous sites. Um, 
often with people with uh, lots of spears, burning lots of firewood because it's cold. We need big fires. Where would you get that firewood from if there are no mm. trees or very few trees? And certainly so few trees that if there was firewood, it wouldn't be replenished very often or very quickly. So you couldn't just go around burning fires just because it's cold or, you know, just because, <laughs> well, you know, we need to... It's a bit chilly around here or, you know, we need to dry off something or we need to cook this food. You just... You couldn't. Yeah. Um, so, And that was one side of the PhD is, is basically pointing out, well, hang on, guys, before you start saying that people would have done this and done that have you have you looked at the environmental data or have you just you know got gone on one and said that they would have done this and they would have done that and in a lot of cases it was a, a case of well you know that we've got these spears so they must have had these spear shafts and these spear shafts must have done this and we're going to do an experiment and we're going to use poplar as our spear shaft poplar that famously is matchwood easy to split very light worst wood you can ever use but but we're going to do our experiments and we're going to say that these points they do this without looking at the whole of the spear so and i guess that was the gripe all phds should basically be a gripe with uh, other research <laughs> yeah uh, and just pick it apart and then come out with this new thing and uh, that was my gripe um because my argument was that you know, if you're going to have a composite spear that's either got a stone tip or an antler tip to it, um, the most important part of the spear is not the tip, because if you just had the tip, it could be a knife or it could just be a, a small piercer. It wouldn't be a spear. But if mm. you had the spear shaft, it can still be a spear, as we know from the fire-hardened wooden spears from Clacton in Essex in the UK or in Schöningen in Germany. They're just pointy fire-hardened spears just wood but still a spear they don't yeah. have a point on them probably more like a lance than a javelin but still a spear um so going back to you asking about antler well perhaps the two come together a little bit here because you've got very few trees um that can either be burnt or used for timber for shelters or for spear shafts you certainly wouldn't have had things like hazel or ash that you think of those classic uh spear shafts wood species that are really nice and light they're flexible perfect wouldn't have grown in those environments it was too cold there wasn't a long enough growing season wasn't enough soil too much permafrost you wouldn't have got those species what you would have had is things like pine larch and silver birch and that's about it really um, not your classic species at all um, and even then for those classic species there wouldn't have been very many of them maybe in some uh, sheltered pocketed landscapes may be on south facing slopes um, so is there a connection between the spearhead and the spear shaft why have antler well let's look at the antler tips I suppose and for those early orignation spear tips they're not just a simple spear tip that you fit into a notch or a split in the wood the split or notch is actually in the point it's a split based mm. antler point and that's the interesting thing because you don't see anything like that apart from these early origination points so the weakness changes position because classically you'd have your spear shaft with the notch to fit the stone point or the antler point but in this case the split is in the spear tip whereas the piece of wood your shaft is just beveled so the weakness is in the spear tip and as they were hunting reindeer, and reindeer would be dropping their antlers, the raw material is all around. But by changing the split and actually putting the what we would consider later as a socket, like a socketed spear, um, is actually in the spearhead. So that the spear shaft doesn't have that weakness. It's got a much greater chance of not splitting, not breaking, because it's the valuable part. Mm, so really, you think it's a, a technique for just preserving wood? Yeah. Almost like, you know... The point would split off in the animal and the spear would be perfectly okay to use as another weapon as that was so hard to obtain as opposed to the antler. Yeah, definitely. And you could use that in a variety of hunting scenarios as well. You can either just be throwing these spears, going for pot shots, or if you're corralling reindeer into an enclosure, you could just be ramming those points in as deep as they go, pulling the spear shaft out, the point is still in there, and just easily attaching another one going to hit another animal there are various ways you can go about it well i almost want to say a semi-automatic spear as a, yeah. <laughs> as a result of that lethal weapon yeah 
How would they, would it have taken a lot of force as they were antler points to uh, hurt these animals? Were they quite sharp? Yeah, I mean, for part of the PhD, I did a few experimental tests um, to try and reconstruct uh, aspects of a real life scenario. Because if you're going to really test them, you'd have to go out to some grassland in uh, Siberia or Mongolia. Then you'd have to get some reindeer there. And then you'd have to actually throw these things and try and hit the deer. Expensive, tricky, but most importantly, not very ethical. And I don't think I would have got it past the university <laughs> ethics board somehow. Yeah. Um, I think the finance department would have balked at the idea, and then the same for the ethics department. But yeah. uh, you, you're just not going to do that. So I had to just break that sequence down and look at the way that these things would fly in the air, whether they needed fletching or drag to it so that they actually flew better, or whether they could just fly by themselves like javelin. And after that, looking at the actual impact and seeing how much damage they could do in quite a controlled environment where you'll uh, have some grip on the amount of velocity and force involved. Mm. Um, and having a look at other bits of research, um, the suggestion, the margin for a fatal wound is a, for large herbivores is around 20 centimeters or so. Um, quite so deep. That, that's pretty deep. I mean, yeah. that's... For, for people who are still working in Imperial, and that, that's what... <laughs> Don't even get me started on that. Yeah, I, I live in America. Then I... <laughs> yeah, it's eight inches. Eight inches. That is a, a, a really deep wound. That's yeah. going to cause a lot of blood loss. But the, the key thing there is that it, it's very likely to pierce a vital organ. Mm. Um, and they were doing that. The problem that we did have is that we were using a drop shaft um, which can either be weighted or, or it can be gas propelled. Um, and we had some problems um, obtaining the right velocity. We had to increase force, um, which, which is a bit of a trade off, but it just means that uh, it has a slightly harder punch. Not much, but because it's such a short drop. Um, you really have to speed up that impact so that it's yeah. getting to that point where it's starting to mimic um, that uh, something close to how it might have been with that perfect shot from a really fast throw. And the, by looking at the way that some experienced javelin throwers were throwing the replicas, I could see how fast they were going um, with fairly flat shots. Um, so it had some bearing on it, but uh, they were definitely getting that 20 centimeter uh, kill depth um, and it was only until the uh, spears were starting to crash into harder things like wood or um, thick paper that they started to break they were really tough really surprisingly tough interesting yeah I mean the reindeers use antler to fight so it must be pretty impact hardened or, or pretty strong stuff yeah the really weird thing was that for a couple of the videos is that once the uh, hammer had dropped, which was the holding device um, for these short spears, is that they punch through the ballistics gel and quite frequently the hammer would then be drawn up for the next shot and the spear shaft would still be in place, but the, the antler spear tip was still wedged in the ballistics gel. And mm. with that very tough split base point, it was keeping the wound channel open like a splint. So the blood loss would have been massively increased because you know if you put a projectile um that's got a shaft in it it will just plug the wound behind it mm. it's only when you know you pull it out that uh, it starts to um cause uh, blood loss trauma but if you've got this thing wedged deeply with it splinted open you know yeah you hit a vital or you know grazed an artery or something you know this animal is going to be going down in a matter of seconds fascinating yeah i mean <laughs> If it, if it wasn't an effective weapon, I suppose they wouldn't have used it. The Uruk Nation spanned, you know, thousands of years. Yeah. And if it didn't kill reindeer, then then they wouldn't have bothered with it, I suppose. So that... These are the first modern humans into Europe. So the, these guys are real pioneers into a new landscape. Um, so as well as the actual very fine view of uh, looking at the hunting equipment, these people are using a new material, a fairly new material, over a very wide landscape. We're talking thousands of miles, not just mm. this site here they used those and over here they made them like this. They're consistent over a very, very wide period. And that's really unusual. 
Um, and if this was in a later period, in uh, Mesolithic or uh, for some other time period, people would be going nuts over them. I mean, people go nuts over hand axes and all the shape of hand axes, and they must yeah. have meant this, and all sexy hand axe theory. <laughs> it's not too dissimilar with split base points, and it sort of gets ignored a little bit because you know split base points are not great big nice hand axes that look really nice that antiquarians would have absolutely loved um, yeah but it's it's is interesting that people went that way so i think there's more there'll be more research to come when i get that spare time i keep promising myself it's never gonna happen but that spare yeah. time i keep promising myself not after the thousands of orders for sexy hand axes oh, yeah. you're about yeah. to get <laughs> fascinating stuff you really have uh, put the icing on my cake to this video it couldn't have been more perfectly timed everyone as i said should follow dr james dilly on twitter visit his youtube channel and more importantly buy these brilliant replicas an ancient craft.co.uk all of this information is going to be pinned down below and uh yeah thank you so much that's quite right